Okay, so now we're coming into our final increment, and we need to do, as usual, a little review. This whole Matthew 25, going all the way through the end of verse 12, is an epic of history. Okay? That's the whole point of it. The epilogue about that epic of history is here in verse 13, which ends up having to do with the, um, what do you want to call it? the putting down of a regular recurring swarm of anti-semitism and I'll cover that just a little bit in this because you can you know check the dates yourself which is one of the things that Christ has been tracking throughout but um, I haven't said much about it so far this segment of history therefore which is you know, displayed as a story about the ten virgins, therefore talking specifically about believers, because this is the kingdom of heaven, not the kingdom of earth. This is really important. Kingdom of heaven. And the whole problem in this story is that the, the virgins, believers, are trying to make a kingdom on earth during this epoch. That's what's so wry and satirical about this story. They belong to the kingdom of heaven. But they're trying instead, and that's what we're going through right now here in 2015 through 2018. They're trying to make a kingdom on earth. They're ignoring what the Lord said here. And they're ignoring what the Lord said in John 18.36. So as far as they're concerned, they don't want a husband. They want to dictate to him, just like they're doing here. Lord, Lord, open to us. They want to dictate to the husband. They don't really want a husband. They just want status. And therefore, we have a parable of ten virgins, half of whom, five out of five, half of whom are coming back here. This is 1999 through 2023 trying to get political power so they can dictate to the real God what they want. That's exactly what why Trump got elected. Because apostate Christians, going all the way back here to Jerry Falwell and his silent majority with the Nixon thing, they ended up becoming the, the Reagan thing, they ended up becoming the Bush thing, and by the way, the Bushes were very... Um, savvy about this they they didn't encourage or discourage the Christians trying to back them but they did say America's not ready yet for the stupid pro-life thing so the Bushes were smart about that they knew that the whole pro-life movement was anti-God but they didn't want to you know push against they just said no okay well this is the end of Bush too who stayed on the alright and then in right here comes our boy Obama chances are he's a believer too and now he's being replaced by Christians backing Trump and Trump is you know a nominal believer at best but here he's a poster boy for the Antichrist because the whole idea of the Antichrist is to join church and state which is exactly what Christ was saying we get out of finally the democratization of Bible starting at the English Reformation so this new trend of history that starts in chapter 25 with the ten virgins is basically saying that throughout this period 50 percent of Christianity is going to be stupid and the other 50 percent of Christianity is actually going to use 1 John 1 9 for a change so we'll be filled with the Spirit but it's not like they're all the ones who are using 1 John 1 9 are you know, really smart or really superior. Oh no. Because this story starts out, yeah, here's 10 of them. Alright. And they're collecting together waiting for the coming of the bridegroom. And then we saw the play on bridegroom, the war of Austrian succession, who's going to be the husband of the Holy Roman Empire. The thing that's really important to understand though about this right here and the foolish ones among them going for the politics 
He said, this is really the first world war in history, true world war, because at this point, by 1749, <coughs> excuse me, wait a minute. <coughs> At this point in 1749, the Europeans have colonized wide portions of the world so that when this war breaks out over the Austrian succession, it ends up having little wars that break out. And at this point, it's little wars including the area we now call the United States. Okay? But it was happening all over. It was happening in China. It was happening in the Dutch East Indies. It was happening in Africa. It was happening in Latin America because the Europeans had spread out by this point all in the name of the Lord to evangelize. And with the missionaries came the tradespeople. With the tradespeople came the military. And with the military came the desire to control and have politics. And that's kind of what happened. And China has never forgotten that. Okay, China's whole foreign policy is based on preventing this from ever happening again to them. All right, and you can't, you know, who can blame them for that? But this is where the First World War essentially occurs because of the colonization all over the world by the Europeans. All right, all in the name of God, of course. And so everybody's waiting for the arrival of the bridegroom. But the question is, who's, who, which bridegroom? Real guy or fake one? And so they're resorting to politics because the bridegroom isn't there yet. And so we're going to try and make him come. And that's a keystone characteristic in preterism. Is that Christ will come when there are enough converts. And that was starting up during this time. That whole false doctrine was starting up during this time. Okay, it was part of the reform movement. But Catholicism had its own version of it long prior. Only now we've got many popes, not just one. Because the Protestants are running all around with their version, saying, well, we're the ones that are right, we're the most true with God, blah, 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 and turning it political. All right, so as a result, of course, you end up having the Seven Years' War which also had, because again, the colonies were all around the world, had some, you know, worldwide application. Okay, as a result of that, a lot of people left Europe, were moving to the United States before we were really the United States, and so here's where we become the United States. The United States fights a war in 1776. This is depicting 1788, and this are a lion, the word oil. Because of all the war that went on in Europe, a lot of people left, came to the United States so they could worship God in their way in peace. And the United States Constitution was ratified in 1788, created in 1787. And of course, 1786 was the end of the war that started in 1776, ten syllables prior. Okay, I'll let you count the syllables so you can see how Christ is satirizing, you know, the Revolutionary War. All right? But this is a ratification of the U.S. Constitution. It takes effect in March of 1789. Aye. Right. Now notice, this is the definite article for the foolish virgins. I mean the wise virgins. They took enough oil. So the, the United States at its beginning is characterized in a sort of positive way that we left Europe with all of its silly religious wars fighting. Because, hi, do you want to fight a religious war or do you just want to know God? If you just want to know God, you get out of Dodge. That's the story Christ has been telling all along. That was why the Bar Kokhba Revolution was considered a blessing. Remember when Paul called it a blessing? Why did he call it a blessing? Because you're getting out of Dodge. So long as everybody was stuck and staying in Jerusalem, they were all fighting with each other over who was more godly. Well, that's not the point. The point is God, not how good you are. The most greatest evil that there is in life is someone trying to be good. 
be with God and don't worry about being good. He'll make good on you. That's Romans 8, 28. You're good, you're bad every day. Something good about you, something bad about you. So what? Seriously, what does that buy you? Not a thing. Donald Trump's a bad person. Everybody knows that or should. And look what he, look, it doesn't seem to hurt him. Okay, so why are you trying to be good? Why don't you just try, try to be with God? And that's what people were doing in the U.S. They were leaving Europe in spades so much so that we finally end up fighting a war. We get our own constitution. And wise virgins are busy learning him. That doesn't make them good. It is a wise thing to do to learn him. And looky here, by the end of the period, it's 1812. The War of 1812, yet another war on the European continent. Okay, well this ended up, again, because from the War of Austrian Succession onward, all wars ended up having worldwide effect. We ended up having to fight some of that. We called it the French and Indian War. After we're newly a nation, that was our first war with involving Europe after we became a nation and had broken from them. So from 1789 we start our constitution until the next war in Europe that spills over to the United States which we call the French and Indian War. 1812, of course that involved Napoleon who was what? Pretending to be a husband for Europe. Okay, he gets put down and he gets put down right in here. Now, when it says 1812, I don't know what month, so I'm just treating it as a whole year. I'm treating this as 1813, the Kron, okay, for Kronizontas means delaying. I'm treating that as 1813, but it might really still be 1812 in a different month, okay? I don't know what fiscal year is, be, uh, is in mind here, okay? Since this is March... Of 1789 it could be the sacred year but I'm not sure that's what's being used I don't know what fiscal so we're just treating these as if they were calendar but they might not be so this is 1812 war of 1812 begins at the end of this phrase hey okay meanwhile the wise virgins because it's all about the wise virgins bringing their own oil they aren't in Europe might be some of them, I'm sure. But a lot of them moved to the United States. And what's c considerably um, unique about this period is the founding of institutions of higher learning expressly for the purpose of learning and living on Bible and being missionaries. Okay? And a lot of Bibles were being translated into Indian languages for the Indians by Americans, especially in the northern part of the United States, upper north, Massachusetts, okay, New York, that sort of era, that sort of stuff. There was a lot of evangelization going on in the United States. So this is really pretty apt text that the wise virgins, you know, took their oil with them. All right, but now look, while the bridegroom was delaying to come. In other words, they're all getting ready for the bridegroom. They're learning and living on Bible. That's all real good and everything. But in the back of their minds, it's like, we should get something for this. You know, Kiliasm was at an all-time high, too, also, because of the wars that had gone on here, 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 and here. People start thinking about the second coming. But he's not coming the way they think he ought to. The whole lot of debate that goes on, and you can find a lot of these articles in Google Docs about what scholars were debating about with respect to the Bible and what it means, Kiliasm versus Millennialism. This is when, you know, they, they sort of like rediscovered, oh, wait a minute, there's this thing called pre-trib rapture. Yeah, it's got a special Greek term, Harpazo in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, which is translated with the Latin rapto which is why we call it rapture in English, not because some girl in England says, oh, it would make her rapturous. Rapture means to snatch up in a raid, specifically to snatch up a woman. You're an incoming tribe of men in a raid, and you see all these women in the city that are left behind because you've killed all their husbands, and so you snatch up a woman and take her as one of yours. 
That's what harpazo means in Greek. That's what rapto means in Latin. So rapto doesn't have a happy connotation. It's got a violent connotation. All right, so people were expecting it to happen because of all this violence. And the Lord the Lord's not coming back? How come? By this point, you know, a treaty has already occurred in 1815. Uh, what's his name? Napoleon is back on Elba. He's going to die soon. And Joseph Smith comes in in the United States. And since translating to Indians and evangelizing Indians was all the rage, of course, he makes his claim about how the Mormons originally went to the Indians. See, he's got to compete. All right. So while the bridegroom's delay, now watch this. All of the virgins fall asleep. So yeah, we started out real good in 1812. Here we are in the United States waiting for the bridegroom, but we get tired of waiting, and we fall asleep. Now in the Bible, falling asleep has two basic metaphorical connotations. It's a metaphor for dying, and it's a metaphor for you know, not being alert, you know, like in the Garden of Gethsemane, what, you, you couldn't stay awake for an hour, you fell asleep on the job, you weren't using and learning and living on Bible, so the whole nation, and actually there's a metaphor of the whole world, everybody falls asleep. They either die or they turn off Bible. Now what's so interesting about that is this is the same period when a whole bunch of manuscripts that had been in the Middle East or sequestered in Europe among, among which people start being found so we can start knowing that yeah we really have the real Bible and this is when a whole bunch of new Bible translations come out and new universities are found and stuff like that and despite all of those finds and all that really hard work, these are some of our best lexicons come out during this period. We fell asleep. We fell asleep to the meaning of it while we're busy, 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 busy doing our collecting. In other words, our theology fell asleep. But the activity of actually getting the manuscripts, discovering the manuscripts, collating the manuscripts, writing up the lexicons, all of that grunt work was being done but we were asleep as to the importance of it and instead we were busy drooling over the coming of the Lord. Rapture. Big hang up on the rapture. Big hang up on the second advent because of all these wars that had been going on and you know we're aware of Matthew 24 but we don't know its meter. We had forgotten that. We lost this information. Even though meter translations are coming out during this very period, right, left, and center, there are so many meter translations of different sections of the Bible that come out during this time. And I did earlier videos on that showing the catalog of Bible stuff that I found on the web. Can you imagine this? So this is what it means to say they fell asleep. See, all of them fell asleep. They just all, oh, let's just go to sleep now. We fell asleep in the sense of being, what do you want to call it, numbed with all of our collecting of manuscripts and all of our collecting of lexicons and all of our starting of universities and all of our busy, 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 busy. That's a way of falling asleep to the larger picture and the larger meaning. And we all are prone to that. I mean, I've been doing this meter now for um, eight years. And I still have problem believing what I'm telling you. Why? With this much proof? Eight years I've been doing this? I've been documenting it from eight years, from Genesis to Revelation, and I still am asleep about the meaning of this thing? See, so I'm just as guilty as the people I'm accusing. Make sure you remember that. Don't ever think anything good about me. The only good is God. And here's the proof. We all start falling asleep. These are the wise ones and the foolish ones. The ones filled with the Spirit and the ones not. All falling asleep. So the kindness of God, the grace of God, that's when he starts all the many MSS finds. And we get busy, busy, busy with them, but we fall asleep as to their meaning. 
and instead were drilling over the rapture. All because of all these wars that were going on. You see? So that takes us to 1832. All right. And so now we need a wake-up call. Oh, here's here's the, the bridegroom. Yeah, Codex Sinaiticus, and then followed closely by Codex Vaticanus before the end. This then takes you to 1856. This is the, like the first time that Tischendorf, he went back several times to St. Catherine's Monastery. The first time he discovered some manuscripts, and he, kept, he keeps on going back. So he's in the middle of the going back and forth by 1856. And then it's continuing, okay? So all all the all the 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 virgins, okay? Oh, here's the bridegroom's coming. See, middle of the night. At your darkest hour. The bridegroom is announced. Yeah, here's Sinaiticus. Oh yeah, that's right. It's Bible that we're about. We want we want to find out the Bible. Here's our great greatest complete manuscript that was being thrown out. Being thrown out. See, asleep. They all fell asleep. Everybody at St. Catherine's Monastery fell asleep. And in comes Tischendorf and oh. These manuscripts you gave me to light fires with, well, they're actually the word of God. Here's the bridegroom. Oh, we have the most cor we have the most complete manuscript. And there's actually three of them, and this was the beginning of his find of them. See, bridegrooms come and come out to meet him. Yeah, you're meeting him at St. Catherine's Monastery here. Isn't this funny? Okay, well that wakes up the rest of the com that wakes up the the bride the the you know the potential brides the virgins. Oh, they all wake up and they trim their lamps. Okay, so everybody's awake now, and this is now 1882, and this is when Trigellus comes out with his memorized copy of Vaticanus. He was allowed wa to walk in to the place where Codex Vaticanus was and an athlete turned the page and he was allowed to bend over and look at it and what he was doing for eight hours a day was memorizing what he saw on the page and then he'd go home at night and write it out and at this point he's starting to publish what he memorized because the Vatican refused to publish that Codex they call that Codex Beta now I think they call it Beta all right, that's Vaticanus. That's our second most complete manuscript of all of them that we got. Okay, so that's when Trigalus is doing his thing. And of course, in the meanwhile, you got a bunch of Hebrew manuscripts are coming out because the Jews, just like everybody else, are escaping persecution. And the United States is a place that they can go because most of the United States is uninhabited. And if they don't like a town that's being anti-Semitic, they can just move on and start and found their own town. So a whole lot of Jews came to the United States, thank God. So now we got Hebrew manuscripts inside the United States. Anunfias in Hebrew and in Greek because after all, he's a Jew. Hello. You got that? Alright. So this whole story then ends up becoming the sort of gradual awakening to Bible for itself. Without state control. Without a papacy control. Without some big church control. And of course there are rivals like Joseph Smith, but they have their own adherents. But it's a wide open country. And if you don't if you're not liked in a town, you shake the dust and you start your own town twenty miles away or ten miles away, which in those days was far enough. Okay? So now we get to eighteen seventy three and that's nineteen oh three. And now we're getting into this particular period was yet another war in Europe, War of 1870. Actually, that had started here and ends here because this is 1882. But now we're starting to walk into World War One, which officially started in 1914, which is right here. So now look. Pro Oeste. Go forth. That's World War One too. That's World War One. Pro este. 
Okay, so that's 1915, 16, and 17. And that, of course, would be the Russian Revolution at that point. And you can count Malon if you want, because you don't know when in 1914 this is. Alright. Por oeste. That's three syllables. Malon makes it five. So it's a little bit of overhang, because technically we say the war ended in 1918. But it had ramifications that went on after that. Okay? And then, of course, we got World War II. Alright? And World War II, how does that start? Well, this is 1910, this is 1940, therefore. I'm sorry, that's World War II. Sorry. This is World War I, 1884, Spenute. Our lamps are going out. We're dying. Start of 1914. And then, answering. That's World War I, right there. This is World War II, right there. By that point, we're tired of fighting all over the world. And what happens? The wise virgins are telling the foolish ones, go get your own oil. Don't take our territory. Don't take us. Don't try to take us over. We want our own life. We got our own oil. Go get your own. So as, this is now 1960s, as the foolish virgins are going to buy the oil, as they are leaving, the bridegroom comes. In other words, all those Bible scholarship now, we've got tired of fighting, we now have time to collate all the texts, and we now, unlike before, where we were all falling asleep, see we're falling asleep here. But now we're awake and, oh, this stuff really means something. And there's an explosion of Bible teaching. At the same time, there's an explosion of backlash against the Bible teaching, i.e., by the King James only us, who want to become politically active. And for the first time in history, pro-life is invented as if it were a Bible doctrine, which it is not. Not even the Catholic Church which teaches life at conception ever, ever made a law calling abortion murder. This is an invention of the Protestant Christianity, especially with Jerry Falwell and all of his other jerks that are now bu still backing Donald Trump. Untold apostasy in America, and a whole lot of teachers in the 1960s were very much aware of that. So you had two trends going on in the 1960s, particularly in America, which of course had ripple effect everywhere else. Here's the real Bible in the Hebrew and Greek. Let's learn it. Just to learn it. Yeah, that was what Christ was talking about in the very beginning. And when he's talking to people in 30 AD, they had all done that. That's why he could just quote scripture to them and they knew what he was talking about. Okay, now we're getting back to the first century. And the whole purpose of everybody having a Bible. Everybody having the Bible in their head. It's not some liturgy, and it's not something from on high by some guy calling himself a pope or a patriarch. It's just you, it's just God, and just you in your head. And yes, you need a teacher, because you always need a teacher. You need a teacher in kindergarten, you need a teacher in grade school, you need a teacher in college. But once the teacher teaches you, you got the information in your head, so now use it. That was trend number one going on in the 1960s, highlighted in black. Trend number two was, oh, we don't want to know anything about God. We don't want his word. We don't want the intimacy with our husband. We want a politic and do it all in the name of God. And those two trends have been going on ever since. And they continue to go on into the end of this epic, which is 2041. Meanwhile, the anti-Semitism, which is illustrated here starting in 1941, is part of a series of cycles that started in 638 A.D. every 430 years. Okay, that's playing on Exodus 12, 40, and 41. Satan likes to play in the Bible, too. 120 years after that cycle starts, then it ends, and this is the 120-year mark after World War I started in 1941. 
And I hope you realize that uh, World War II, rather. I hope you realize World War II is all about anti-Semitism. 120 years after that, 2060, 2061. So the anti-Semitism, you know, rise that we see now, especially under Trump, but amongst the Muslims, that swarm is going to stop here. It started big time in 1941. Hopefully you can go look that up and see it yourself. And the time prior to that was 430 years prior to that. Okay, basically what you're looking at is about every 430 years. Satan can't always get it right on time. 638 AD was the first time that they swarmed plus 430. Second time they swarmed, they started in 1068. They managed to take over Jerusalem 1071. I already did the videos on that. Okay, the third time that they, and they swarm, the swarm lasts for 120 years. The third time is 430 years after that. Again, he doesn't quite get it on time. That's 1498. It actually ends up being 1517, the same year that uh, Huzi Watts is, uh, did his 95 theses. Jerusalem is overrun yet again by the Arabs. And then we got another 430 years after that. Be 1928, but again, he doesn't quite get it right. Ends up being 1941. So, 1941, which was the beginning of World War II for us in the United States, because the United States is a focus here right now, plus 120 is 2061, which is right here. So that's when the current anti-Semitism rise is going to exhaust itself. At which point we are in a new period of history. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. There are three servants in the story here. One of them gets five talents, meaning a lot of money. Talent was approximately worth a million dollars today. Another one, another one gets two talents and another one gets just one. Three servants. This is the tale of the three servants. It starts right here. And it goes all the way down to verse 30. This is a new epic in history beginning in 2061. It's basically, from given what we've seen before, what we're looking at here is basically an idea that two-thirds of believers will be productive and one third will be really nasty. That's the stingy servant who buries the money that he gets in a napkin. In other words, everybody's getting, you know, access to Bible. Some of them take more of it than others. And the one who takes the least is the most sneaky about it. Now that happens to be the same proportion as being told in the story of the original fall with the angels back in the Civil War times before man was invented. Where two thirds of the angels stayed with God and one third rebelled. So this is mimicking the end of history. Okay, and of course the end of history occurs in the story anyway, not necessarily the true end of history, right here, which is 3250 AD. So this is a pretty dramatic switch in history. I do not know whether it still means the United States is the focus. This could be. Latin America, could be Africa, could be China, could be India, Russia, I don't know. But it goes on until verse 30, the next epic in history, which is 600 years. So the next 600 years are going to be far more productive as far as believers actually listening to Bible learning and living on it. But after that, who knows? After that, it looks like it goes really dark, to be honest. Because, see, the next story is about the whole sheep and the goats thing. The Lord actually comes and, and he's handing out the final rewards and time ends. Now, how literal is that? Well, it could be. The, the text is still true. It's just a question of when. And the way he words this, since it's, he's doing the Talmudic 7000 when he plays the 3150 here, it's... it's metaphorical as well as literal for that year if that year actually occurs but there's no guarantee that that year is actually going to occur if the rapture happens tomorrow okay see look 
the rapture happens tomorrow here we are okay well that's 2017 alright so if we say well it occurs at the very end of this phrase that's 2023 well 1050 from 2023 doesn't take us to the end see so it would be 2023 because that's 30 plus 1993 and we add 1050 7 actually to include the tribulation history would end at 3080 which would be 3050 in this chart alright which isn't even marked off separately closest we get is 3038 alright well there's all this other history to go through so does it just get cut off or is this how say something about how long it takes to do the final judgment of time after the millennium is over I don't know okay I don't know what I do know is that for this next 600 years after the final anti-semitism you know swarm goes under it's not really the final one but it's ours the one applicable to our time is that we're going to see a very productive time for people really understanding and believing in Christ all the way through 26 well 2632 all the way to the end of verse 30 here all right so all the way from verse 14 all the way to the end of verse 30 okay whoops that's still too far all the way here 2632 2662 AD it's a fertile period for Christianity after that it goes really nasty and it goes really dark in what way? I can't tell you. I ha you have to be closer to the actual years before they occur before you'll know specifically. It's because we're so close to this time now that I can tell you that this means this has to do with Trump and Christians trying to take over government. It's not Trump per se, it's that they're using him in order to take over government. And that they're going to get wiped out and you know the whole pro-lifer movement is going to get repudiated and everybody's going to know it's repudiated by God by 2041 and then the whole repudiation of anti-semitism you know the rising of the cockroaches from 1941 that's going to be thoroughly repudiated so the world will get arrest from both groups by these points that's all I can tell you right now and then after that comes in a very nice period relative to Christian faith until 2662 now it's a nice period if you're on the nice end of it it's a not nice period if you have to be around that one-third that stingy servant who's busy saying you know you're a nasty person God I hate you if you have to be around that one-third it's going to be it's not going to be so nice for you but for the bulk of the world it's going to be a good period because when you got a lot of believers believing in Christ, learning and living on Bible, that makes history more productive. That makes more for more prosperity. So we're coming into a prosperity period, definitely by 2061. But between now and then, it's going to be rocky for Christians because Christians have to be judged for their pro-life status which is anti-bible and pro-life is just another way of trying to get political control in the name of God so that you can reverse history back to the dark ages which everybody kinda knows even if they don't know this pro this prophecy you know rightwingwatch.org and a whole bunch of organizations are aware of the fact that the Christians backing Trump are trying to take us back to the dark ages yeah they are so don't blame the Catholics anymore. Everybody's a Pope now. And that's what's wrong with this period of history. That's why it's so black. And it all started with Jerry Falwell, who's dead now and knows better. And his son is still supporting Trump and doesn't know any better. And so this is a dark period of Christianity right now big question is how far is it going to spread? Is it going to spread outside the United States and around the world? And so far the answer is yes. All we can hope for is that sooner or later people wake up and smell the coffee by the time he starts talking here. Because this is a tribulational period for Christians. 
okay? Not necessarily by governments. Just God doing the judging. And then he says, I don't know you. And one way or another, even though they don't know the prophecy, the world's going to figure that out. That these people backing Trump and all the pro-lifers are vile, anti-God. He's not in them. And they're just speaking on their own, pretending to be holy, which they're not. They might be saved, but they're not holy in Him. Okay, they'll go to heaven. But it's a bad period for those believers. And so God's letting a hundred flowers bloom now so that they all come out and you can see how power mad and power hungry they are. They get repudiated, they get exposed, and by 2041 nobody listens to them anymore. And then the same thing happens to the anti-Semites by 2061. So I think that's where I'm going to stop the videos right now. If you think I need to cover something further, let me know and I'll do more videos. But I want to say that this section now is pretty much where it should stop.